Okay, uh, so, uh, first time? Yeah, I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say this has been one of the most unfortunate eras of Precure, and not entirely because of more subjective traits like the series' general writing quality that I've already complained enough about, but rather things that have been well out of the anime staff's control. I'm sure they did everything they could to make sure that their stuff was password protected, and if anyone should be blamed for this latest hiatus, I think Toy's tech supports for not splurging on slightly better virus protection, but I digress. Really? At this point, I think we should just be hoping that this franchise can make it to its 20th anniversary in 2024. Because while I don't want to sound like a harbinger of doom and gloom, especially when I don't have any solid evidence to back it up, I always hate it when toy shows don't achieve their full potential for reasons beyond the creator's control. Which leads us to our subjects of today, Healing Good Precure and Kamen Rider Ghost. Now, I don't think I have to go over the former struggles, as the thing that led to its troubled production is still relatively fresh in everyone's minds, but I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with the 17th Heisei Rider and his troubled series. Series. To just give a quick summary, as the name suggests, Takir Tenkuji was a common writer who died in his first episode and spent most of his series trying to find ways to revive himself while also helping some wandering spirits, both of the living and the dead. We'll get more into the finer details of that show in the review proper. But yeah, while I won't pretend like this was a perfect series, and even if nothing bad had happened, it probably would have been, at best, maybe an above average series. But at the same time, I can't stand the thought that it never reached its full potential because of one selfish exec. Allegedly, a lot of ghost budget and resources were funneled off in the middle of production to the pet project of executive producer Shinichiro Shurikura's Kamen Rider Amazons. As a result, stuff like much-needed new suits for the riders couldn't be made, and more importantly, the head writer couldn't be paid, and thus he did in fact disappear for a good chunk of the series. So, while I have heard conflicting reports on the validity of these claims, it does seem to check out, plus it does match up with the M.O. of this problematic producer. Yes, for whatever reason, Toy has kept around a producer who has outright said that any writer series not produced by him are juvenile. So of course he makes his stuff as dark and edgy as possible, whilst also forgetting about a little something called the plot. Sorry, went off on a little bit of a rant there. I'm just really concerned that he might also end up screwing over Don Brothers, especially considering that his old buddy Toshiki Inoue is writing it. Don't you dare just kill off Haruka. The point I'm trying to make is that, be it from executive mailing or other behind the scenes issues, it's clear something wasn't going right during the production of Ghost, which is indeed unfortunate. Thus, in a bit of a meta context, it does make sense to have these two cross over in a dojishi. Even though there was another, more likely reason why these series were paired up, and I'm also weighing on a crossover with another series. But yeah, for today, we're going to take a look at another book by TJ Type 1. And before anyone asks, I bought this as an ebook off of DL site, which is a great place to shop for Dojishi, especially since they have a full English site. Anyway, the last book of theirs that we took a look at was the excellent Heisei Precure vs. Show Riders, which ended up becoming a bit of a love letter to the Heisei era of Precure, as the Reiwa era was quickly approaching. This story will tackle similar themes, though with a much smaller roster, with a focus on mostly three series. Obviously, we went over the first two, though as for that third series, well, let's just take a look at the Ghost of Healing and see for ourselves. It's going to be a bit of a surprise. Now take a look at the cover for this one, as it provides spoilers, so instead, let's cut over to Nodoka struggling to breathe. Oh god damn it. So yeah, this story seems to take place right before she was discharged from the hospital. Though in this scenario, it doesn't seem like she makes it to Skoyaka as she wakes up in what appears to be the afterlife, having finally succumbed to years of suffering from the Byokens. Fortunately though, this wasn't a full-on Shurikura production, and Nodoka was only mostly dead, as explained by Yurisen here. For those who don't know, this is the mascot character of Kamen Rider Ghost who acted as Takir's guide through the afterlife. He also just so happened to have a familiar voice, as even pointed out here. 
Yep, he was voiced by Aoyuki, and don't expect that to be the only reference to the modern Queen of Magical Girls in this book. Anyway, just like what he did with Takeru, he explained the concept of the MacGuffins of his show, The Icons. 15 little plastic eyeballs that house the souls of 15 heroes, and by collecting all of them, a person would be granted one wish, which thankfully Nodoka compared to the Dragon Balls rather than that other thing I don't want to talk about. However, in Nodoka's case, she wasn't going to be looking for the souls of a good chunk of the FGO roster, but rather all of her soon-to-be senpai. Thus, the two set off on a glorious journey to find the 15 Heisei Precure icons, which, due to the constraints of this book's limited page count and my own schedule, we'll just skip to the end. Damn, the Trouble Productions actually followed us all the way here. Anyway, the two managed to acquire 14 of the 15 icons, but Yurisen, for whatever reason, had only now noticed that the list he had been given only had 14 names on it specifically of all the lead cures. To make matters worse, the icon they just acquired was stolen by a certain passing through rider, and this time it wasn't decayed, but rather his on and off again buddy Daiki Kaito aka Kamen Rider The End. For those unfamiliar with the living embodiment of all of those damn eBay scalpers, Kaito, as his name suggested, was a thief who, depending on the writer, could be a benevolent Robin Hood of sorts, or a sudden file boss because they rolled themselves into a corner. Thankfully, this story leaned more into the former, as not only did he return the icon, albeit rather rudely, but he also did provide some very important and kind of meta exposition. This included pointing out something that some of you may have already noticed, that being that there are only 14 lead Heisei Precure. This revelation was so shocking that it made Nodoka become really meta, and had her pointing out that the Precure had been running for 16 years straight by that point. But Kaido countered by pointing out how two of those years had direct sequel series Max Hart and Gogo. And since they couldn't do any dimension hopping like they did in the last OGC to result in two versions of either Nagisa or Nozomi, there could never be 14 Heisei Precure icons as the era had already ended in real life. Well, that sucks. Understandably, Nodoka tried to confront Yurisen about this, but he honestly didn't know that they had been sent on a wild goose chase as an unreliable third party had informed him about the icons. Said third party was apparently some dude with a swirly face and a yellow glow to him. So, Obito put on some yellow highlights and decided to make Nodoka a part of his overly convoluted and stupid plans. Well, no, thankfully, the antagonist of this story wasn't the end result of that overwritten garbage, at least was always meant to be unlikable. Yep, good old Mr. Invisible Necktie Masato Kusaka, aka Kamen Rider Kaiza was here, and while Kaito managed to provide a very accurate description of him, as well as incidentally himself, I guess I should go a little bit more into detail. Kusaka was the main secondary writer of the fourth Kamen Rider series, Kamen Rider Fies. You get all that? But yeah, basically he was the main rival of the title character, and while he kind of helped him on occasion, he was unquestionably a colossal asshole, which again was the point of his character. He was a classic irredeemable heel, thus, and spoilers by the way, when his atrocities finally caught up with him and he was killed by a guy who he had tortured throughout the season with his own rider gear, it was one of the most satisfying deaths in the whole franchise. By the way, if any of that at all sounds familiar in regards to Nodoka, well, just hold on to those thoughts, because the parallels are going to become even more blatant in just a minute. On a bit of a side note, Kusaka's love to hate them status ended up becoming meme-worthy in the Japanese fandom. Hell, his own actor is in on it to the point that every time he reprises the role, he purposely hams up all of Kusaka's most over-the-top evil traits. It's honestly pretty damn delightful, even though what he actually does isn't all that pleasant. And this was on full display here, as he revealed the reason he had tricked Nodoka was so that he could come in as her knight in neon glowing armor, and likely propose to the teenage girl. I mean, okay, to be fair, he was mistaking Nodoka as Mari Sonoda, the female lead of Fies, and yeah, while the actress Yuria Haga looked nothing like her, the character did have another actress playing her during flashbacks to their childhood. 
Yep, that's a 10 to 11 year old Aoyuki playing Mari, and I guess because of his damaged state of mind after having his neck snapped, Kusaka was projecting Mari onto Nodoka because of her voice. So yeah, this was a very roundabout way of making yet another VA reference, but you could say this creeper whose actions really shouldn't be excused at all, was also acting as a bit of a precursor for what a way at Nodoka in the future. For now though, she shouldn't have to deal with this bastard, so Yurisen tried to hold him off while Nodoka, without so much as a thank you, just ran off. Again, I'm not approving of anything that Kusaka's doing here, but at the same time, I love dark humor, so I'm actually enjoying all of this. However, considering Nodoka could barely sprint a few feet at the beginning of Healing Good, she barely got anywhere as a mostly dead spirit. And on top of that, Kusaka's trademark mental torture, she was ready to throw in the towel in a really heart-wrenching scene made even more powerful thanks to TJ Type 1's excellent attention to detail, as we could see every little sweat, tear, and dishevelment on a completely defeated Nodoka, who appropriately enough, after all this despair, was looking very Madoka-ish. Because as far as she knew at this point, her whole life was only one misfortune after another, and it was going to all end with her being the punchline to some sociopathic stalker. And yet, as Kaito pointed out through some slightly overly flowery dialogue, I mean I get that he's trying to point out a bunch of unrelated things and how they all eventually lead to death, but why bring up a crocodile's lifespan of all things? What a croc! And that's where we get the term. Anyway, the point he was trying to make was that while death can be a tragedy, it can also be something that pushes us forward and encourages us to live our lives to the fullest before our time ultimately comes. Ironically, he even brought up Nodoka's future catchphrase, which considering how meta he's been in this story, I'd like to imagine he watched Healing Good's pilot ahead of time, which would explain this whole Nodoka not being born thing yet as her show still hadn't begun at this point. And yet, even without the meta context, Nodoka still ended up saying the big climactic line of her series with yet another really well-drawn TJ face that, while still soaked in despair, also had a slight light of hope to it. And looking at the 14th icon, she is able to recollect something the last Heisei Precure had told her. Also, yeah, I guess everyone was just suddenly metacognitive, as Hikaru seemed to realize that there wasn't a 15th Heisei Precure icon. I mean, who would have those sorts of fourth wall breaking powers on everyone? I should it. Anyway, she went on to explain how lights from faraway stars can actually take up to centuries to reach our planet, so unless you have a really good telescope, many stars would be invisible to our naked eyes until much later into the future. And yet, that future star and its light could become a part of something great. Thus, and even with a creepy stalker just a few feet away, Nodoka began counting up her sins, I mean icons. And while there would technically never be a 15th Heisei Precure icon, which can I just say, really damn clever, using the fact that there had only been 14 non-sequel Heisei Precure series to match up with Kamen Rider Ghost's lore, Nodoka still believed that it existed in some fashion as everyone was capable of becoming a Precure, no let's not take it that far. I think the more exact thing she was trying to say was that anyone can become the hero of their own story through the influences of others. Of course, Kusaka tried to talk her down and- No, I'm not kidding, they actually do reference the famous words of Hibiki Tachibana, which were kind of appropriate when Aoyuki character was talking this much about the future. But yeah, having accepted the League Cure's souls through the icons, Nodoka also accepted everything they symbolized. Their courage, their hopes, their resolves to persevere through even the darkest of times, those are all things Nodoka would carry with her, as once again, we got a similar message as TJ's last book, where it was stated that when the day does come, when this franchise truly does end, their memories will live on forever, which in these very unsure times is reassuring to think about. And thus, even though on paper she would never be considered the 15th Heisei Precure lead, but rather the first of the Reiwa era, Nodoka was still the 15th in spirit and soul. The icon itself became a projection of her future self that, as Kaito pointed out, shouldn't even exist in the world of Heisei, 
But if anything, Nodoka knows how to break the rules, especially if it lets her kick the ass of an obsessive stalker. With that, Ghost Grace put up a good fight against Kusaka, even repelling every exceed charge he could throw at her. The fight then came to an end when he made the worst mistake possible and tried to tell Nodoka Hanedera how she should live her life and, well, may as well just let it speak for itself. <laughs> With that, her story ended with Nodoka fully recovering from her bout with both the Byogans and a creepy stalker, for the time being, unsure if even what she saw was real or not. She also befriended a familiar looking cat whose owner soon arrived to pick him up. Nah, I'm sure neither of these two are all that important. Well, nowhere near as epic as the last book, just kind of happens when you don't have Hiroshi Fujioka around, this was still a very enjoyable read, and in some ways, even better by being so much more of a personal tale. As I've gone on record to say, Nodoka is my favorite pink lead of this franchise, so getting another story exploring her struggles with overcoming difficult adversities is always engaging to see, especially with TJ Type 1's great art. Cross her over with series that work surprisingly well with healing goods themes, and you get one of my favorite doji scene of the year so far. Moreover, it is just reassuring to see a precure remind us that no matter what directions this franchise may end up taking, the memories will always remain alive within us. For this story, they use some rather clever thematic connections between the three toy properties. I mean, aside from the obvious VA connections, Ghost and Fies works surprisingly well as series that also had themes of living the best life you can even while on the brink of destruction. Then, coincidentally, Takir's 15 Icon Goal and the 14 non-sequel Precure series lined up really well for this particular tale. Speaking of whom, while it was a pity that the actual Kamen Rider couldn't play a bigger role and instead Nodoka essentially became him, even though she's already x there was already a more than apt cast to hold things up. Again, I like Kaito when he's more than just a pointless antagonist and can actually act as a good mentor to young prospective heroes like he did here with some pretty poignant words for the future cure. Murasen, as usual, was good comedy relief and even helped out a little. But of course, Kusaka stole the show with his pure unrefined dickishness. I mean, putting aside the extra creepiness, he made for a good antagonist and chronologically a good precursor for Darizen. And of course, I always like to see Nodoka find it in herself to stand up even more so in this case as she wasn't even a precur yet. Still, as this story posited, even if she had never met Rablin, she still held on to the souls and influences the precure left on her as it has on many of us fans. Thus, whatever direction this franchise may take after so much crap has been thrown its way during the 2020 so far, the messages they've left behind will always remain true. So, whatever happens going forward, let's just keep living until our last flames burn out. But yeah, with that, this is going to be our last sort of filler review as Delicious Party is coming back next week. And you know, since we are this close to 7k, why don't we round up that number before then, huh? Yeah, I'm being shameless. But yeah, I gotta say, while I went into these videos with absolutely no plan, it was fun getting creative and figuring out how to make slightly longer format content within a week. Still, it will be nice to actually know what I'm going to review over my weekends and can now fully return to some of my longer content that I've been holding back on. So, look forward to all of that. And until then though, farewell for now my friends and uh... Marty. Nope, looks like Kusaka found an Aoyuki character. Well, I know what three numbers to put into my phone. Nine, one, 